Here's an idea. Reality TV might affect our views on surveillance. I think I've said this on Idea Channel before, but I always think of the reality in reality television as something of a genre designation and less of an accurate description of what kind of television you're watching. It's kind of like the word wrestling in world wrestling entertainment. It's definitely wrestling, but it's also very different from the wrestling that came before these very large, theatrically minded gentlemen. Wrestling isn't about wrestling, it's about wrestling. Likewise, reality TV isn't about reality, it's not a documentary, it's about reality. I'm way prettier than you! You could say that it's about verisimilitude, or the appearance of being real, being related to reality. It might even be that any situation Situation, as soon as you point a camera at it, stops being strictly real, especially if people are involved. It's kind of like a media-related observer effect. Anyway, though some part of us might know, possibly deep down, that reality TV is anything but, many of us still tend to talk and think about it as though its realness were for real. There was all kinds of upset when it turned out producers might have been planting valuable items in storage wars. Yeah. Certain shows which imply that they are on location are actually filmed on sets, and that's a little disappointing. Many shows employ a technique called Frankenbites, where bits of dialogue are recombined to create previously non-existent scenes, and that feels dishonest, though not very surprising. Maybe it makes sense, then, that many producers have started distancing themselves from the designation reality and have started calling their shows unscripted drama. Regardless, we are gonna watch it in droves. Duck Dynasty, Survivor, and American Idol were amongst the top watched shows in America last year. And regardless of their ratings, Jersey Shore, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, and Real Housewives are massive cultural forces. We watch these people go about their everyday lives under surveillance. In a paper for Psychology of Popular Media Culture, Karen Riddle and J.J. DeSimone even call this subgenre of reality programming the surveillance subgenre. And maybe that surveillance is something like the previously wrestled with reality. Maybe we don't think of it as surveillance, but as a kind of er surveillance. Surveillance. Unless we're talking about Big Brother, in which case, yeah, that's just plain old surveillance. You have to admit, though, that the situational and technological arrangement of things bears at least a passing resemblance to the process of being surveilled. People, their lives, cameras, and the recording of generally not public odds and personal ends. It's no privacy. And sure, reality stars might be willing in many respects. They might even be handsomely paid. Though it's arguable whether or not said stars know exactly what they're signing on for, and might, if not for the promises of riches or renown, be otherwise unwilling to have their business broadcast. Does a contract and some bucks make make the whole thing any less exploitative or imbalanced? I'm not sure. But I am sure that many of us, tens of millions of us, classify the whole arrangement as entertainment. And I'm not saying it's not. I grew up on the real world and MasterChef is a seriously intense guilty pleasure of mine. But reality TV or unscripted drama or whatever other rose by any name would smell as real, which is to say maybe not at all, it does confront and familiarize us with a group of well-known people willing to have their lives recorded, sometimes 24-7. Is there a chance that the popularity, or at least the very presence of such a media phenomenon, in some way exalts, or maybe just normalizes, being watched? Because, and at the risk of trivializing some very important business, it turns out that all of us, Americans at least, are likely stars in our own little reality series. Except it's not produced by an eccentric millionaire or a TV genius, but by someone who works for the government and I imagine looks like Mr. Universe from Serenity. Related, of course, of course, to watching people and being watched is the very important concern of privacy. Kim Kardashian willingly elects and selects certain people to breach particular privacy boundaries, while at the same time she battles with another group that is not, strictly speaking, approved. Which sounds like a pretty normal arrangement. Like you're probably fine with your parents watching you eat breakfast or your significant other seeing you get dressed in the morning. But it would be a little weirder if it were that guy from the sandwich shop, or that lady from City Hall, or President Obama. Of course, your parents probably aren't pointing a camera in your face for the sake or due to the popularity of an internationally aired television show. The point is, I think it's fair to say that privacy is different for different people. Or in the words of Daniel J. Solov in his paper, I've got nothing to hide and other misunderstandings of privacy, we should think of privacy as a set of family resemblances. In philosophical investigations, Ludwig Wittgenstein argued that some concepts do not have one thing in common, but are related to one another in many different ways. In other words, privacy is not reducible to a singular essence, but is a plurality of different things that do not share one element in common, but that nevertheless bear a resemblance to each other. Or as Garrett Keezer puts simply in his book Privacy, what preserves mystery might also be mysterious. Privacy for some people is don't you look at me, and for others it's 
yeah, they'd rather not have you looking in their windows. And for others still, it's I got nothing to hide. I think of this last one as the reality TV brand of privacy. If you haven't done anything wrong and you like who you are, why should you be afraid of inviting the world into your life? Well, lots of reasons, I'd say at least. So Love covers them much more completely than we ever could hear, but on the short list, you probably do have some things to hide even if you think you don't. Privacy isn't just yours, it's everybody's, and functional privacy is in some ways arguably integral to a well-functioning society. So, but then, topping the rating lists are successful and oftentimes very entertaining people who seemingly have nothing to hide. The Riddle and DeSimone paper referenced earlier explains how reality TV can influence viewers' ideas of reality, reality. That they can think what happens on Man vs. Wild or The Hills is what the world is actually like. And I wonder, given the similarities between what they call the surveillance subgenre of reality TV and actual surveillance, it could then influence those viewers' ideas about privacy as well. What do you guys think? Is it possible that reality TV could influence a viewer's ideas about privacy? Let us know in the comments, and if you subscribe, I can't promise that I won't tell the world. And also, if reality TV is your jam, get excited because a little birdie told me that Jamin on Game Show is talking about reality TV and The Sims this week, so that comes out tomorrow. Keep an eye out. And also a clicking finger. I learned so many new euphemisms for booger. I think my favorite was bat in the cave. Let's see what you guys had to say about algorithms. Genesis Shin Zyril Kai says that it might not be the algorithms worthy of a spiritual consideration, but maybe the computers themselves, um, as a lot of people don't think of uh, the software or the operations happening on it, but rather the object itself. And I think, yeah, I used to, um, I used to do work in uh, tech support, and the number of people who came in and their computer was just this magical thing beyond their control was, yeah, it's a high number. I think that's it's a very astute observation. Mike Rugnetta. Danley 9 grad says that a lot of people might have the same attitude towards algorithms and spiritual concepts, but that there is one very important distinction to be made, which is that if you have a strong grasp on um, mathematics or the sciences, that you can dive into algorithms as far as you want and uncover how they work. And while I agree that that is true, I wonder at what point actual access gets in the way of that, and that you are not really going to be able to get to the bottom of literally every algorithm. Some will just always be mysterious. To everyone concerned about my pronunciation of dog, I also say scenario, ideology, and gif. I, um, deal with it. And then read this Slate article that's really good. I'll put a link in the description. Doug, actually, as it turns out, is the second most popular pronunciation. I don't know if it's the right one. And frankly, I don't know if I'm, I don't know how much I, I don't care. And the abyss stares back, Lexman895. Andrew Murray kind of gets to the heart of the question when he says that religion is, is kind of defined by what you give agency. Um, and that there is, there is probably a group of people who gives more agency to technology um, than they give to their own perceptions and actions in the world. And I might add um, that they, they might even do that unconsciously. That might not be a decision that they've made. Or Jairus Galamatis, to whom I want to sincerely apologize for butchering their name, uh, then brings up a related point about creators. And so where does the agency lie in that relationship between algorithm and programmer? Is the algorithm in some way bigger than the programmer that made it? Is this, this is kind of like a question of, you know, is the captain the ship? Does the captain control the ship? Does the relationship make something that's bigger than the sum of the parts? I don't know. Mr. Monfrey's class and Daniel Maloney see a connection between this unseen power of algorithms and trouble related to net neutrality. Um, Parker Ensing relatedly wonders why that idea of big semi-invisible power, why I might correlate that to spirituality in some way and not just people's lack of understanding about technology itself, which is a very fair point. And I think maybe the nugget of the episode that like we're trying to get to is that like, is that is that what spirituality is? And is that what technology is? And it seems like, it seems like the responses are all over the place, which I love. Relatedly, Philosophy Tube and a couple other people wonder whether or not spiritual is even the right word in this context because spiritual things tend to be privileged and technology more and more is becoming a quotidian thing. And I don't know, because something is every day, I don't necessarily think that that means it's not privileged, but that's an interesting question too and maybe why I think why this whole conversation is, is so 
apropos and cool. You guys are all so smart, I love it. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these Snot Rockets. We have an IRC, a subreddit, and a Facebook page, links in the description. And the tweet of the week comes from Wythe Marshall who points us towards an infographic detailing the super future. As the subtitle says, it looks like there may be trouble ahead.